What's going on, people? We are Tottenham TV back here for another panel show. We've got a star studded guest here today, starting with our uh, recurring guest, Sai, down in Portsmouth. How are you doing, Sai, mate? Hello, guys. Great to uh, be joining you guys. It's been a while. So, uh, looking forward to it. Awesome. Great to have you back, my friend. And all the way from Nashville, Tennessee, the star of the fan shows recently, Royce from <laughs> Tip Top oh. Tottenham. How are you doing, Royce? Welcome I'm, to the panel show. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to uh, share my opinions with all of you this morning. I'm doing great. I'm really excited. Yeah, good to have you here, man. And uh, yeah, if you don't know this guy to, to my right hand side, he goes by <laughs> the name of Sim from uh, We Are Tottenham TV. But um, what's your name? <laughs> my name is, as you can see on the screen. Um, but look, we've got a lot of topics to talk about today. Usually for a panel show, we do bring you four topics, but we've got five topics today. So an extra bonus one for you guys, which will leave right to the end about Daniel Levy and a bonus. Uh, but um yeah. We're going to be talking about Spurs' current form recently because there's been a lot of talk about Spurs' form. We have been getting points, but uh, the narrative around the form is that we're not on good form right now. We'll start with you, Royce. Do if you, you think... went on social media, would, would you think we'd be losing 8-0 yeah, every you week? Yeah, think we're in a relegation <laughs> battle. But, uh, Royce, we'll start off with you. Do you think, how, how do you look at the Spurs' form? Do you think we're on form, off form, or is it somewhere in the middle? That's a really good question. I think when you compare our recent performances compared to the beginning of the season, you may say, no, you know, we're not in good form right now. But when you consider the entirety of recent performances, you know, it's clear for everyone to see that when we're at our best, we're able to put together really beautiful moves in the system. Mm. And even with the Fulham nightmare uh, that I don't want to think about anymore, mm. the Premier League just recognized Ange for this morning for a manager of the month nomination. So, um, you know, that leads me to believe that we're not obviously on the worst form in the world. I know you guys spoke on your five takeaways against West Ham. Um, Sim, you went through the stats about how we play better when we go a goal down. And so that made me curious to, to look at our stats of when we had scored two goals in general. Um, when I, I went and looked back through all of our games this season, we've actually only lost one time um, against a team when we've scored two goals i think i said that right yes we've only yeah. lost, we've only lost one time and that was to brighton um at the end of last season at the mx so like you were saying ben it would have been a completely different game if we were able to to get that second goal in the first half against west ham um vicario has been a proven shot stopper whether the the attacker has been offside or not um but when you consider some of the goals that we've conceded especially in the most recent game it's obvious that set pieces are a huge problem like yeah. a lot of the um, Spurs community has has alluded to. I think it's a little bit naive of Ange to not uh, have a set piece, set piece coach currently. Uh, and that in combination with Harry Kane, obviously no longer being in the squad, you, you can remember how deadly he was and how much of a threat he was um, on corners and, and set pieces. So taking that out of the squad, obviously, you know, removes that, that danger aspect. But if I was Ange, if I was him, I'd be on the phone calling up uh, Giovanni Vio immediately to enlist his services, the set piece coach from from last season. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think it's a bit, it's hurting us too much now that we don't have a set piece coach, not not just from a defensive aspect, but I think from an offensive aspect as well, like we need to be doing better uh, from set pieces all around. But Sai, what do you think? Do you think we're a team on form, off form, somewhere in the middle? Are you happy with the way things are going at the moment? Yeah, I think it's somewhere in the middle, mate, um, to be honest. I think one thing or two things we kind of got to analyze here is the sense that obviously the beginning of the season was absolutely fantastic. So I think there's a lot of comparables to that. And it, I think it's typical Spurs fans in general. We always tend to just cling on to those kind of things and expect that to happen all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't massively like, as you know, the kind of injury excuse too much, but... Uh, the fact of the matter is we're a relatively thinned squad, to be honest, if you look at it in detail, that when those key players do go out, it will become very problematic for us. Whereas those other sort of like top three, top four teams can very much look at their bench and have some really good replacements come on, if, you know, matching that ability or higher. So I think there was always going to be a bit of an area of of a form dip. And I think some of those injuries, I think people uh, maybe don't understand the injuries themselves, but 
you know, Madison, I know we'll talk about him in a bit more detail later on, but Madison's injury was quite a complex one, as was, of course, Mickey van der Ven's with the hamstring. That's a terrible one to to pull. It's a very hard one to come back, especially if you're a fast player. And Ben Secure is one as well. I mean, he had a double whammy. So what you've got there is not, not necessarily, I would say, a dip in form because the players aren't good enough. I think it's because most of the players that have been coming in and out or back from injury, you know, they're kind of expected to just be back to how they used to be immediately when actually this just doesn't not the way it works. Um, so they're all trying their best. Ben Secure has come out very recently and said, you know, openly on national duty that he has a, a major injury still, uh, but he's playing through it because he doesn't want to let everyone down this, that and the other. And I think Sorry, Ange, Ange says it's not major. He's got nine other toes. It, it, it 100 percent. It 100 percent is. And that, the kind of injury that he had and he even came back from from earlier in the season is is substantial. It changes you as a person. It changes you as a player. It makes you think differently. And we it's not singling any players out at all. You, we just got to have a bit of an understanding that these all do play a part in that form perspective. And I think that, um, you know, aside from that, from the games that I've certainly been going to, that that middle of the park has been inconsistent in itself. It's almost like we don't know the coordination, the combination of players that we need to put in there. And yes, the players should be good enough to just come in and do a job. But ultimately, that does affect the rest of the team. We saw it over many seasons, uh, playing with some certain players in defence or wherever those positions might be in midfield that affects the trustworthiness or the confidence in the rest of the team to go, oh, actually, I don't really want to pass it to him because it's probably going to come back to us in five seconds. And it's that kind of mentality. Um, so, you know, when when Van der Ven's back in, it makes things a lot stronger. And I do think, you know, to build on that, what we had at the beginning of the season can only really be seen next season, in my opinion. I think this season is just so transitional. Um, and... We didn't want to expect things. We were told not to expect things because everything went so well in that three or four month period. We got our heads set in it. So that's that's kind of why I think we're in the middle. But we also need to understand the complexities, like all the things that externally or all the variables that are occurring as to why that might might be happening, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I do agree with that. And I'm looking at maybe our form since the turn of the year since January we've lost two games in that period in the Premier League which was obviously the Fulham game and the Wolves game and when when I'm looking at the wins aside from that obviously we um I'm I'm taking the cup out of this so we drew against Man United which was probably quite a positive display um 3-2 against Brentford which I thought we weren't that good that day but we got away with it with our with that 10 minute spurt at the beginning of the second half uh, Everton away um, was up and down. Um, Brighton at home was okay. Uh, Wolves at home was terrible. Palace at home, I think, was very dominating. Uh, Villa away was the, obviously the best of the lot. Fulham away was probably the worst of the lot. And then you've got Luton at home, which, you know, we dominated them, but we probably should have created more. And then West Ham away, which we dominated them and probably should have created more as well. So I'm looking at those kind of run of games and I would say I wouldn't say it's good form from a results perspective I would say it's good form but I think from a performance level I think it's been fairly patchy yeah. um what, what I would say so I think when I'm always trying to judge form and judge results and everything I always go back to the first 10 games of the season because that was like a sample size of maybe what Spurs could be like with with the um you know first 11 being back fit and when you look at it since we've had our first choice defense in this season I don't think we've lost the game um mm -hmm. with Mickey van der Ven, Kuti Romero, Destiny Odoggi and Pedro Porro which is unbelievable to think about and where would we be this season if we didn't have those kind of injuries so I'm happy with the way things are going. And I think for Spurs to be showing these kind of patchy forms is kind of expected, isn't it? Because I think the first 10 games was, wasn't expected with the way a new manager coming in, losing Harry Kane and all, all the kind of facets that go along with that. But with us getting the results, I think it's a, it's a very positive sign. Um, only two losses since the turn of the year. So I'm, I'm happy with what we're showing, but I think with the first 10 games of the season, if you look back at that, you still expect more in that kind of sense in terms of a performance level. Where are you at with it, Sim? I think for me, um, 
because you even if you take from the turn of the year, we had the Asia Cup, we had the Afcon, we had we had more injuries in that period as well. So there's been a lot of destabilizing moments. I'm looking at since the end of February, so the last five games essentially, um, since everyone I feel like has been back had a little bit more time. I do think our form has been generally good. I've been pretty happy with how we've controlled games, how we played, barring that Fulham game. I thought Palace we played pretty well. I definitely think we deserve to win that game. Um, I don't think three one was an unfair result. Villa was brilliant. I thought the Luton home game, in my opinion, we should have won that by four or five. We had the chances to win that. Two miraculous events in that game. Two one in a million events um, um, somehow uh, meant we didn't score more goals in that in that game. And I think the West uh, the West Ham game, yes, uh, um, on Tuesday, I for one didn't think it was such a bad performance. I know we should have created more, but I think people have gone way, way overboard on social media about how bad we were in that game. We dominated them pretty much the whole game. West Ham, obviously, look, West Ham was a very difficult game, especially given that we're um, their uh, main rivals as well. They have that extra motivation. We saw not even that long ago, a couple of weeks ago, Aston Villa went away to West Ham and struggled badly. And that was a very different performance to our performance. They should have lost that game. Um, Villa, um, West Ham dominated them and had the um, loads of disallowed goals and, and should have won that game um, uh, two, two, at least two or three one. We went there and we and we controlled the game for ninety minutes. We were camped out in, in their half for a lot of the game, and as unfortunately we didn't after, after going in the lead we obviously get, gave it up um, in a real uh, bad fashion with a poor goal from a set piece and that killed our momentum a bit after a really fast start in that game. But I still think in general that those kind of performances is. That is kind of the learning curve you're going to get when when you're up against a low block, right? And you're asked. That's obviously one of the hardest things to do in football. That's why teams play a low block. They know it's very very difficult to break down. And not just that, it's going to be a team like West Ham who are very good at doing that. There there are teams who sit a low block but aren't good at doing it. But West Ham aren't one of those teams. They're always tough to play against um, for most teams as well. So. Obviously, it was a disappointing result and a frustrating night, but I didn't think the performance in general. I thought we played a lot of good football on that day and actually it go, went under the radar. Obviously, the one bad, really bad performance was Fulham away. That was inexcusable. Um, that was a really, really shocking display and it took everyone by surprise, especially as it was a week after um, beating Villa away from home. But I do think in general as our players have come back, as we've got a fully fit, uh, the squad is now fully fit, more fleshed out, we've got more options off the bench. I do think our past five games of form has definitely uh, improved. I do think we are playing quite well at the moment and it's made me more excited going to these last um, eight or nine games of the season rather than when you look on the discourse of social media at the moment, you, after a result where we don't get the win, everyone acts like it's a disaster and acts like we're playing really badly. I see even people saying, is it like we've been bad all season? Uh, is anyone enjoying uh, the football at all under this manager? Um, what is like, are we playing good football? All this kind of rubbish. Like, I don't understand why people are going so overboard. I think where we are in the process at the moment, if you compare where we are in our first season compared to a lot of the top managers at the same time, we're well ahead of where, where they a lot, a lot of these managers were in terms of um, the process we're on at the moment and how far Ange has gotten. And even in the patchy form, like... It's not even in those patchy games that you're talking about. We still, in those games, have really great moments where we're on top and playing good football. Unfortunately, we can't sustain it for a lot of those games for 90 minutes. But that is the process. The process is sustaining it for 90 minutes. You're not going to get there straight away. You're not going to. A lot of the times, you're not even going to get there in, in the whole of the first season. A lot of the times, I remember under Pochettino, very rarely we had a 90 minute performance in that first season. I remember that was that Chelsea game one five three. Uh, that was like one of the only times in in his first season where yeah. we had like a real dominant performance in, in his first season and then it comes with refining with um, refining of the squad um, with more time on the training pitch all this stuff will come but I'm looking at our last five games I actually do think we're on pretty good form I think we are playing well at the moment and I think people people have this narrative oh Villa you know they went down to 10 men Luton we had to score a late goal to win uh, Palace we struggled we had to score late goals to win so it creates this narrative that we were struggling in those games but in my, my opinion I'm watching those games I think we deserve those victories I think we 
are playing well. And I think um, I think people need to realise that um, it's always going to be a work in progress, but the form we're actually on is pretty good, in my opinion. Hmm. Yeah, Royce, do you think it's maybe down to maybe because it's not as free-flowing as it was earlier on the season and maybe coupled in that Spurs fans do have major, major PTSD when they look back at previous tenures? You know, Conte started off on fire, then dropped off like, uh, you know, dropped off massively. Mourinho started well, dropped off massively. And all these new managers that seem to come in start well. Even Nuno, you know, we, we won our first three games and then uh, dropped off massively. So do you think it's it's to do with that as well? Yes, I definitely think that previous uh, managerial experience and how that their form has fallen definitely uh, plays a, a factor in that how Spurs are feeling about our form right now. Um, I, I think when you consider the, the players that Ange has brought in and when you think about the players that were at the club when he came in, yeah. I wrote it down quickly. I mean, Ver Werner, decent squad option at the minimum. Solomon, can't judge. Phillips, promising prospect. Valise, promising prospect. Vicario, unreal player. Dragason, you can't really judge yet. Van de Ven, no explanation needed. Madison, no explanation needed. And then Brennan Johnson's on unreal form right now. So to me, he hits way more on players than he misses. And I saw as well on social media how right now we're three points away from our point total of last season. I know last season isn't the standard by any means, but um, I feel like if we just give him two, three, four more transfer windows, we really could be in a great spot and, and be a lot closer to where the majority of the fan, fan base wants us to be. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I'm, I'm so happy with Ange. I can't believe all the, the I, I see on social media, I see it in our chat sometimes being Ange out, Ange is clueless, Ange is this, Ange is that. And I'm like, like Ange is doing a great job. Like we lost, ha like, people don't, I, I think people don't actually realize how much of a big factor it was to lose Harry Kane on the eve of the season. And not only that, brand new way of playing the starting 11 is unrecognizable from last season as well. They've never played uh, together, the majority of these teams. To get Mickey van der Ven to slot in as quickly as he has done and be one of the leading defenders in the Premier League, I think it's all unbelievable. And, and to say that we haven't lost a game with our first choice defense as well, I think it's unbelievable work from Ange. So um, I think when you're judging the form, I think we're on good form. I don't think we're on unbelievable form. And I think there's still so much more to come from this team, which is the exciting thing about it. Um, I'll let you have the closing words on this topic, Si. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's to your words, mate. I think you know, Ange is, is going to be and is a fantastic manager. Again, back to my point, you can't click your fingers. It's not going to be immediate. Um I love Sim's point, actually, and you guys know full well uh, I've sat at train stations after games and depressed <laughs> moods from what I've seen in front of me and the audacity of players that get paid a lot of money to not turn up when I'm spending three or four hours each way getting to the ground every other week. And what's, what's great, and, and my dad and I have spoken about this many times, is even if we've lost games, which is obviously really annoying uh, and depressing at most times, you come out of the stadium going, we gave that a good go. Um, and there were elements of the game that were really good, exactly to Sim's point. If that wasn't happening, I would be majorly concerned because, hang on a minute, we got new batch of players. That ticks the massive box in loads of supporters' minds because we've been like, still got the same team from like five, six years ago, blah, blah, blah. Um, albeit now Son, I think, is the only one left. And Ben Davies, obviously. And, you know, it's appeasing the fans again, but then we're back to square one of that same situation we've seen season after season after season. So I think that that final remark of, of everyone really is exactly on point in the sense that we have to give those extra windows. We have to believe in, in the project that's ahead of us. I think we're on the right direction. Um, you know, I want to see form, obviously, every supporter does, but I'm also always, if you relax your mind, straight away i'm going to give you guys some zen out there right now because i've been doing a lot of physio and psychological stuff at the moment in the sense that if you have in your mindset uh, accepting where we are as a club right now uh, we all know where we want to be we all know where we should be but right now is where we are if you can get that in your minds right now you won't be as stressed and i know you guys have to use social media but i quit that many years ago for many reasons like this where there's too many arguments too many crazy things going on 
just chill, guys. Like, Andrew's got this. We're going to have some incredible new players coming in the summer, hopefully. And I think we're going to enjoy even better football than we've seen this year. And who knows, we may challenge next year. It may be too early, but look at Klopp. Look at all these managers that came in. It never happened really instantly. Um, and fans just have to be a bit more patient. But that's the beauty of support is you get a mix of emotions, mix of balance, opinions. And that's that's the greatness about football. And I think it's just, as I said, keep a chilled mind, accept where we are. And it will be a lot easier for everyone out there to not get so stressed about it and realize, actually, we're on a really good path here. All right. Nice one. Uh, just before we move on to the next topic, there's actually a comment here that I want to respond to. He says, Martin H says, hi, Ben. Did you watch Celtic in Europe like me? If you did, you would know he couldn't adapt to playing better teams. He got yeah. destroyed. And yes, I'm all to a Celtic fans who loves Ange. And what <coughs> I would say to that is that I did see Celtic in the Champions League. I saw them against Real Madrid and I saw them create buckets, loads of chances and missing bucket loads of chances, which Ange can't really account for. And Celtic and manage and don't get me wrong. Um, and I don't mean to be rude by this, but managing Celtic and managing Spurs are two completely different kettles of fish. And the man and the players that you can attract by in the Premier League and Spurs are completely different caliber of player that you can attract at Celtic so um, Celtic are a massive club and probably um, judging by the fan base and, and trophies you've won are a bigger club than Spurs but right now Spurs uh, can attract much bigger players and much better players and I think the team that we do have at Spurs are better than your Celtic team and are more warranted to fighting those bigger teams so I yeah, that's a good point and I think like when you when you're playing when you're managing Celtic and this, you know the Scottish league has been a certain standard for a number of years now you know back in early 2000s and stuff the Scottish league the Scottish teams were a much higher standard than they are now and it's been decades like a mm. couple of decades now where let's let's be honest Scottish football has declined the fact that long days are the gone days of Henrik Larsson exactly you don't really get that anymore unfortunately even Van Dijk and Wanyama used to play for Celtic yeah. like really good players you don't really get that as much anymore unfortunately and so when you're Ange what when and you're in the Champions League you've absolutely dominated the Scottish League and you're in the Champions League the next season what do you do do you completely go, um, go against how you've been playing to try and adapt to Champions League and sit back and even though that's not the way you play and even though your team aren't used to that to try and what scrape a point and try and like survive in the game or do you try and stick to your principles give it a good go and if you lose then that's that's just reality and I think that you know that's how Ange um, goes about things he doesn't want to flip the script and completely switch uh, um, how his team wants to play because he thinks the best way um, to attack these kind kind of games is to play your way to the best of your ability and that's the best you're going to get and obviously if your team aren't good enough then they're not good enough and for hopefully from Tottenham's point of view that isn't going to be the case with the quality players we have yeah absolutely um look let's we need to have a conversation about James Madison guys uh we, this is the next uh, topic of the panel and we're going to talk about if James Madison's form is concerning because you again we we take it back to those first 10 games of the season or eight games I think it was for Madison where he was probably the best midfielder best player in the Premier League at that point uh controlling games uh dominating factor in games creating chance after chance after chance since he's come back I mean he hasn't been I don't think he's been bad by any stretch of the imagination in certain games he has but he just hasn't been to that same level that what we saw um, in those first eight to ten or however many games it was at the start of the season so for you Royce is is Madison's form concerning I would say his recent run of performances to me shows how important the number 10 position is in Ange's system and how much it's needed for that position to play well um when you look at the majority of, of games that we play this season, regardless of the result, we have the majority of the possession, it feels like. And, you know, sometimes we create our chances, but I feel like to me, through the middle of the pitch, the number 10 seems to be the one responsible for, you know, really creating the moves. And as we saw against West Ham, um, teams that sit in the low block really, really stuff the box, you know, eight, nine guys at a time. And I think that may be why we've been able to find more success on, on the wing, you know, from, from moves from our wingers. <coughs> and I feel, um, you know, we're only going to see these defensive sides continue this trend until we're able to prove that we can beat it. And, you know, so I think a, a conclusion that Ange has probably come to in the premier league is so far is that there's a lot of sides in this league that are, are more than happy to sit back and, you know, kind of just, let us take the game to them and then counter 
and take their chances when they can get them. And especially playing a team like Spurs, you know, with the quality that we have, teams, not everyone is going to come after us. Um, and I think that we tend to play better against the, those teams that really come after us. But Madison and Ange alike are going to have to, you know, really figure out what what they need to do in order to to really break down and unlock these low blocks. Because if we can get Madison to a point to where he's, you know, consistent goal contributions against these really defensive sides, then I think it would elevate our team's entire team's performance level tenfold. I would say I'm getting a little a little bit concerned, but in my opinion, and you know, this is a common saying that form is temporary and class is permanent. Mm -hmm. And those first 10 games of the season, watching Madison play, I was like, yes, he he is class. He is class. And um Son, obviously, for the majority of last season had a bit of a rough patch. And it's the same thing. You know, he's now just banging in goals left and right. He's in the, the golden boot race and the, the playmaker award race as well. So I just feel we have to give him time to be able to make um, the technical adjustments and 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 Madison as well um, to be able to just really feel confident every game, regardless of how the team is going to play that we're playing against, that he's going to be able to, you know, find that creative ball to, to really set up a move for us to score more often. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah, I don't disagree with that at all. Uh, Sai, uh, what's your take on it? Are you concerned at all by Madison's form? Um, no, not really. I think it's relatively down to the injury that he had. Um, I speak he's been back on... for a while now, though. Like he He's has. been back since he latter has. stage of January. He has, however, and I speak from experience, uh, as far as I was aware, it was a deltoid injury uh, to which I fractured my medial uh, came right out of the socket for those that like grim stories. You're uh, always breaking bone football. side. What is going on with you? Oh, yeah. It's, I, I try not to play football, but when I do, it's terrible. Um, so, I, as I said, I speak from experience only because I know these guys are obviously another level than I am on my Wednesday nights in Guildford. But uh, it's, it's the principle that that deltoid muscle um, in that ankle area, mine, mine was actually worse. Mine transferred across and upwards to the inside of the leg all the way up to the knee. And it, it took me a year and a half to get the flex back and that pain threshold reduced, um, balancing feet, et cetera, et cetera. Um, obviously they've got a lot more medical staff around them than I do have with my weekly physiotherapy sessions. <laughs> but the point being is that, um, I wouldn't say it's so much a psychological impact. I would imagine that he still has to probably maybe do specific stretches for it or ice packing, etc. cetera. Um, I don't know the full ins and outs of how far down the recovery line he is, but obviously most players try to come back as soon as possible. But with the type of Madison player that he is, if you think of how quick he turns uh, or, or you know glides past players, that requires those muscle groups to work very, very hard. And when they have been torn or stretched in that situation that he has, I don't know if it was an impact injury, which may have helped slightly, but for mine, because of the snap and the tear, it was a lot worse. But that that can carry with you and it can play on the mind as well. And I don't care how much you get paid, you know, from a psychological perspective, it, it can affect the game. Uh, as I said, I'm not at that level, but when I was playing, I was finding it massively frustrating because I knew I could do more. I knew I could do this before and I still can't yet. And as I said, it took me a year or so, you know, time to do that. Um, if you ever get a chance to research those muscle groups and how they can affect you, it's very interesting. But I, I'm not fussed about his form because as, exactly as Royce said, that that class is definitely there all the time. And we're starting to see snippets of it coming back. I think one of the key uh, situations from being at the game and so close to the pitch where I sit at the stadium is he'll get into really good positions and then there's no one there to support him or he's having to do double, triple work because some other people are not doing so. And that will affect his game in that sense because he's doing things that he perhaps doesn't need to be doing. So I think, it's again, it's a load of different variables um, and and the instance of that that carried injury. It does, doesn't go away. It don't care how long you have out. You know, four or five weeks is just for the recovery. Then you have the strengthening process, and that that can take a long time. So it's not an excuse. Um, I think some of the other players can be pulled up for this kind of thing as well. But there's always usually a reason behind it. 
um, you know, a top class player like that doesn't just disappear off form for no reason. I do honestly think that there would be some elements under the radar that perhaps people don't really consider or think. They just look at a player and maybe not as like a human side of things of like how difficult it is to come back from these kind of kind of injuries. So I, I'm not I'm not worried. I think he'll continue to keep improving. We saw that great goal that he scored against Villa. That shows you that he's getting his pace and momentum back. Uh, we're perhaps missing the extra trickery. And I honestly think that's because of the ankle, just purely from experience. But I may be corrected out there. Um, but I, I have no issue with him coming back over these coming weeks, finish off the season well. And, you know, we're going to have a fully fit, hopefully, touch wood, Madison for next season with all the new players hopefully coming in to add to that class. Come on, Sim. Saw you gathering some stats to hit us with it. No, I'm just looking at um, I'm just looking at Madison's form on a data wise, and that look there has been a drop off for sure over the last um, uh, nine. Well, how long has he been fit for? Nine, ten games now. So he obviously came back in that game against um, Man City, City yeah. uh, in January in the FA Cup game. He came off the bench in that game, and it's I think he's pretty much Brentford, yeah. he's pretty much started every game since then. And he was probably averaging like around um, three or four uh, key passes during that period. He's now averaging around two key passes obviously his goals and assists were uh quite significant i think he got um in his first 10 games he got nine uh, uh three goals and six assists in the the next nine games now he's um got one goal and three assists obviously that's four goal contributions in his last nine games which isn't horrific but obviously you know madison's capable of a lot more than that but for me i'm watching him play uh and i'm not seeing a player who's completely off the pace or anything i'm not seeing a player who's um struggling in terms of um, physically, I still see him doing these same movements. I'm still seeing him glide past players. I'm still seeing him getting in good positions. When it get, What I'm seeing, though, at the moment, when he's getting to the final third, for one reason or another, it's not coming off for him. And we know that that is one that is Madison's, one of his biggest strengths. He's having um, a lot of shots blocked at the moment. A lot of his, um, for one reason or another, he's not being as creative um, as he usually can. But I am seeing him. I remember watching him very closely uh, um, against West Ham on Tuesday. And I was seeing him doing some really like impressive things when it comes to close control getting past people swiveling on the ball but like what, what it, we i think maybe there's extra attention on him or at the moment for one reason or another when when he's trying to pull these things off in the final third whereas in the first 10 games a lot of stuff was coming off for him at the moment he is struggling to pull off pull off those moments of magic we know he's capable of but that's not to say it won't come back and i was the reason I, you saw me looking at stats because i remember thinking early in the season i thought well, wasn't martin odegaard going going through something quite similar near the uh, beginning of the season. And I, because I remembered that. So I looked at his stats. Uh, he went through a 10 game period where he got one assist. It, that was all he got in the 10 game period. I remember there was people saying, uh, you know, he's a formal that kind of stuff. And I look at him now. He's been, you know, last few weeks, he's been one of the best players in the league. I think that's, uh, that's just to say that just because a player goes through a prolonged period of of, of of poor form, or I should say poor form, doesn't mean that this is something to be overly concerned about in the long term. And I think definitely Madison falls into that category. You've seen over a number of years how good of a player he's been for Leicester. We saw in the first 10 games how good he was for us. And even in these last nine games, I, obviously it's been, a, it's been a drop off from the first 10 games. I don't think we, anyone can get away from that. But as I was saying, it's always going to take a bit of time for him to get back to his best. Obviously Spurs fans are hoping it wasn't going to take this long for him to he, reach that, those kind of heights. But I don't think it's like, I don't, I'm not saying, I don't think he's been on the pitch and been a massive hindrance to us or or has really been massively poor in form. I think he's playing okay. Some games he's played quite well for against Aston Villa, he played really well. Um, there, there's been obviously some games he's been better than others. But, we all want him to get back to those levels where he's uh, in the first 10 games of the season, of course. So until he reaches that, he's always going to have question marks about when's that going to happen? When's that going to return? Why aren't we seeing the best of Madison? But I think people, you know, who I see saying we need to have a conversation about him, maybe he needs to be dropped, all these kind of things. I think that needs to just, I don't think it's uh, time for that kind of conversation just yet. You know, with the players that we do have knocking on the door, potentially Kulisevsky in the 10, which we'll get into a bit later, Giovanni Lo Celso, who comes on and makes an impact uh, pretty much every time. Um, if he does have a couple of poor, poor performances, do you not think that, you know, because of the squad options that we do have, this is why we have a squad where if a player isn't, you know, performing to the best of their abilities, then we can uh, swap them out and change them up and, and change it up um, 
you know, for the starting lineup? I would say that's more for um, when there's a lot of games, um, I would say. For someone like Madison, who is obviously our vice captain, who's so important to the team, who's still performing at a decent level. Like, I don't think he's performing at a droppable level, Is my, is, I guess is my point. I don't think he's as good as he has been. But is he at, performing at such a poor level that we need to take him out of the team and he's dropped? I don't think he's at that stage, in my opinion. Maybe other people disagree. And maybe Andrew would feel like he would get a better performance out of Giovanni Vasselso. Clearly, he doesn't feel feel that way because he's starting Madison every game. Would I like um, if Madison's not 100% and he's still struggling with something and he's not at his best and maybe if we put Lacelso in for a game or, or game or two and let him, you know, show us what he can do in a perfect world? Maybe like, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I'm not against that uh, if we think we can get a better um, performance out of Lacelso. But I'm not seeing performance level from Madison where, I'm, where I feel like he has to be dropped. That's my, my opinion at the moment. But um, yes, we do have a squad. And if players aren't playing at their best, should they come out? I guess that's a question. Is Madison playing at the moment better than what Lo Celso is at his best? I, I don't know the answer to that question. But um, I, I think there's there's a case maybe that, that Lo Celso should have more game time than he has done. I think that's fair yeah. to say. Mm. Yeah, I agree with that. And I, I'm looking at Madison's form and I'm... I think to say I'm concerned about it is is the wrong word. I agree with Royce and what Sai was saying, you know, with James Madison, I think it's a clear kind of case of form is temporary, class is permanent. And I think that's clear to see with James Madison. He's a top player. You see that coming out even when um, when he's not on having the best games, you know, you see shit fits, fits and spurts of it in uh, the majority of games he's playing at. But I think it's clear for all to see that he's not playing at the same level um, and he's not having the same impact in games that he was having earlier on in the season before that injury. But I do think it's going to come back. I do think it's going to come back. And it's either, do you play it? Do you play him through it and um, play him back into form? Or do you take him out of the firing line? Well, I, I, the, what, the way I'm re, uh, wording it is a bit harsh. It's, it's the way I'm wording it is to say like, he's had a complete drop off because he hasn't had a complete drop off. He's just not playing to the same levels as he was doing, getting the, you know, a goal contribution a game essentially, where he now he's having like three goal contributions since the back end of January or let's say beginning of February. So it's 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 a weird one in or it's a hard one in which way you want to judge it because I do think we do have players there that can step in and when they do step in they are playing well and we have to have that awkward uh, Dejan Kulisevsky conversation as well. So Royce, do you think it's a case of playing him through it or is it a case of maybe we should be using our squad a bit more? So I, I before I answer that question, I I was just thinking of saying this while you guys were talking about it. In, in my opinion, when you go out and, and play a competitive football match and, and, you know, everybody's really, really defending well, trying their hardest, the number 10 position is is probably the most difficult, I would say, to to be uh, to, to, to perform well at, at the highest level. Um, you know, you're kind, as soon as you as soon as you receive the ball, more often than not, there's somebody immediate, immediately on you. And especially considering how well Madison performed in the beginning of the season. When teams are watching video, they're going to be like, we can't give Madison any space at all, or he's just going to completely cut us open. And also, when you consider how long it took us to find another number 10, you know, how many times have, have we talked about how we've been dying for somebody since Erickson um, to come in and really cre create and, and fill that, uh, that void from the midfield. So for me, um, I, I think a, a combination of the things I just said, would lead me to believe that it's too early to drop him. Um, I, I trust Ange more than I trust the majority of, of football opinions in general. So he, he's the one who's watching, you know, trainings day in and day out. And if he believes that Madison is the one to continue playing, then I think that's the right decision as well. But I, but I think LaCelso is honestly a quality player on his day. And he, he really, I mean, I, I don't know if we should we should sell him in the summer. That's a that's a whole another conversation. But to my answer to that question would be I think it's it's the best thing to continue playing him through this this patch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I'd agree with that. Uh, to be fair, Sai, are you are you in agreement as well? Yeah, hundred percent. I think um, it's exactly to that point that I think um, we've all kind of just said really is that emphasis that he you know there's only a few games left of the season as some people were saying in the chat obviously but i think that it's a good opportunity for him to come into his own game again after everything that's happened over the last sort of couple of months for him injury wise and everything like that but um some people say that in previous seasons he's kind of dipped off like this quite a few times um but you know as i said i think he's more than enough professional He's a player that has the personality that Ange wants. 
um, the style that Ange wants as well. So it's not always all about being a, a top world-class player all the time. It's also the other things that we just don't see all the time or things that happen behind the scenes. You know, it's very obvious that he is uh, a charismatic character, someone that you know brings the team very closely. And of course, that element of leadership's in there as well. So there's, there's a multitude of things as to why I'm not concerned about Madison at all. I think there's a few other players that you could pick out that aren't, you know, playing to the best of their abilities. But that happens throughout a season all the time. You know, you can't just keep picking out a couple of players just because a few games have gone badly for them. Um, I personally absolutely love watching Madison on the ball every time I'm at the ground, you know. Um, as I said, even an instance last last week, you know, there's a few moments of time where he's on the edge of the box and there's no one to pass to and therefore he has to go back and he gets frustrated with them all and he's shouting at them. Um, what more could you want like from a player to be like, guys, we need to be better than this? Mm -hmm. And yes, of course, he probably thinks about that himself or for himself as well on top of that. But, um, you know, it's, it's very easy for Spurs fans. We just sometimes pick on players too much and then the next week they have a great game and then we're we're changing our tune completely that oh they're fantastic now so i don't look too much into it i just know he's a top player a top guy um yeah i'm looking forward to seeing him hopefully step up a bit more in the next few games like the rest of the team all right big up to james madison we're all in support of you exactly. my friend um but an another player that um has come under a lot of criticism since those first let's say about eight games of the season is Eve Bissouma. <coughs> and I don't think he's been anywhere near uh, the levels that we saw from him. Again, he was probably one of the leading midfielders in the Premier League in those first games and those two sending offs happened. And he's never seemed to recover in terms of the way he can drive and ball carry and, and be that driving force in midfield for us. And um, I thought he was absolutely brilliant. And we were even comparing him to like Declan Rice at that point of the season. And now the comparison between them is so far apart that you can't even compare them anymore. Um, I do think um, that West Ham game was a bit of a step in the right direction for Basuma. I thought he was a lot better. You saw a bit of those driving runs uh, in the second half from him. But Royce, do you think that we need to dip into the market in the summer for a number six? That's such a good question. I thought it was really interesting how Ange changed up the midfield against West Ham and played Bentancourt and Basuma at mm. the same time. I don't, I don't think necessarily Bentancourt did uh, amazing, but I don't think he played poorly in that position. Personally, I would have preferred Saar starting, and maybe he didn't start just because he needed a rest. But I think he can offer more going forwards um, in that number eight position. When you look at uh, Bentancourt and Basuma, I feel like a lot of their – their footballing traits are somewhat similar. I think it's clear to see that Ange really trusts Basuma and backs Basuma. Um, his ball retention ability when he's on his day, you know, regardless of how many people are around him, is something that is very difficult to find, especially in the Premier League. And so, um, you know, I, I don't know what's going on with Basuma and the national team that he's playing for, uh, but I, I really believe that we need to back him based off of this recent performance um, and in hopes that he can return to that form that he had, like you alluded to in the first eight games of the season. To me, Basuma seems like such a confidence <laughs> player. A lot of the, a lot of the times I feel like when he doesn't play well, you can really see after games, it bothers him so much. Yeah. Like regardless, even if we'll win, he'll, he'll just be so down on himself. And I think Ange is the perfect person to really kind of put that arm around him and, and be like, you, you know, we, you know what you can do just keep doing you know the right things and you'll get back to it and maybe it was because he had that whole preseason you know Ange and um Basuma together training the system and, and maybe that's why he looks so spectacular in the first you know beginning of the season but considering the quality of options that we have at the six right now with Bentecourt and Basuma like I had said I think considering what our budget will be and what how much we'll probably spend I would prefer if we were to prioritize bringing in another winger who has really good technical ability and is able to beat a man by himself, you know, create a move in space by themselves. And then I would probably look for a backup fullback option before a six as well. When you consider uh, how good Poro and Yudoji are in adding quality moving forward into the opponent's final third, I think it's so paramount to Ange's system and, and outnumbering teams, you know, to, to create space for moves. So when you look at the options, 
at, at those positions, I don't think we have as many options in terms of the quality and the traits that you would need um, to, to really be effective in Angie's system. So that that's how I would answer that question. Do, do would I would I be upset if we signed another six as long as they were of you know Ange approval? I, I don't think I would, but I don't think that's where our priorities should be in the summer. Mm. Sai, do you agree? Do you, do you would you look to bring in another six this summer? Um, it is a really difficult one because we know the the top quality that Bentaker is, and I think the key again to him is getting over the injury aspects that he has had and still has. Uh, as I said earlier, he's openly in the national team mentioned that many times, and he wants to help the team. And I think that's that's a great positive attitude to have. Uh, with Basuma, I think, again, it goes back to that point about form dips, etc. You know, first few games or first uh, few months of the season, absolutely fantastic. Dropped after that looting game and not really come back since. And I think some players are just related around confidence. Um, and, you know, Ange is definitely a manager that can bring that back out. But sometimes it takes players a bit longer and that affects the mindset, psychological aspects. So, um, you know, again, Basuma, we know, is a top player. At Brighton, he was unbelievable. We know that at Spurs, he, um, albeit a slow start to the career at Spurs, did show some incredible performances until as i said that looting game and beyond it's been a bit tricky so will that come back over these next few games now he's getting a bit more game time again will it be something that you know they just need to review at the end of the season and see what's going on see how it reflects off into next season um will remain to be seen do we need another one on top of those two it, it's, it's certainly debatable i it, it's not really uh, in my mindset right now to say that we really definitively need one because I do think those two players are fantastic when when they're on their form. Um, it's just really a question of getting, getting that form and then back to 100%, whether that's mindset-based or physically or, or physicality basis as well. So um, I do, as, as Royce kind of said, really, I think there's other areas of, of the playing field that we need to address more so than others or at least have the backup for those positions because sometimes we're a bit thin in those areas um obviously hoiberg you know some people debate what his actual position number is i think obviously he's going to be a player more than likely being passed away in the in the summer uh, to another club so it does open the door that actually we need maybe a bit more cover in that area skip again people we forget these names because they sometimes don't get on the team sheet very often or come on as subs um he's had good instances in the past probably not good enough no disrespect to the level that we're trying to achieve at the club moving forward so if you're passing those two away to another club uh, or clubs i think there's a position opportunity to get another one in uh, but on that point i would say equally if you wanted to save money like daniel likes to do there are two or three really good academy players right now that could fit into that position quite nicely or at least be the backup then you don't spend any money you've got two decent ones already there and you've got a backup through the academy which we in my opinion we need to see a lot more of those kind of opportunities i don't want to keep having to go and buy players or bring players in um and there's not too many number sixes out there i would say at the moment at least with premier league experience definitively that that we could say that we could get quite easily or for you know, a good amount of money like we've been doing good business in the last summer so it's up in the air but i know everyone's gonna have very different opinions on this yeah i, I definitely will because i think there are so many number sixes from around Europe in the Premier League that we could be targeting right now. Um, the way I look at Basuma is I loved him for those first 10 games of the season, but I'm, I'm concerned about Basuma because, because of what you're saying about him being confidence player. And yeah. we haven't seemed to be getting that confidence back into him. It's been a long time now. You know, it's not just been a couple of weeks. It's been a long time and it's not like he's had a long injury. I know he suffered from um, a small bout of malaria uh, around the AFCON um, thing, mm -hmm. but the, the, the bad form predates that. And um, I'm massively concerned about Basuma, about how much reliant he is on um, confidence. So 
I think it's imperative that we do bring in a number six this summer. I really do. And I'm looking at players from around the Premier League. Jao Palinia, I think, would fit in um, absolutely unbelievably well. Amadou Onana, I think, is an unbelievable player. And I'd love to see him through the door. Jao Gomez, who can play maybe a, a hybrid of the six in the eight role, I think is unbelievable. And there are so many other players from around Europe as well, which, who I think that we could be targeting. And um, and I don't even say like get rid of Basuma because I, I think he definitely has his values and I'll keep him for sure. But I think it'd probably be at the expense of someone like Hoybier and Skip. You know, if you get rid of Hoybier and Skip this summer, who I think that we should be doing, I would 100% be looking at uh, Jao Polinia. Maybe not because he's on the 27 and maybe we won't spend big money on someone like that. But I'd be looking at Amadou Onana. And if you could have Onana and Basuma fighting for that six role, I think that's really healthy competition for next season. I, I, I look at, Bis at Ben Takor as someone that can play the six, but it's not his natural position. So I prefer to keep maybe these players in their natural positions when Ben Takor fighting in the eight position with uh, Bissouma fighting with uh, a new signing for the number six. So I actually think it's really important for Spurs to sign a number six this summer. Where are you at with it, Sim? I think we do need to sign a midfielder because Hoybier is leaving. Uh, Skip can't be trusted. So a number six to compete with Basuma, I think, is important. Now, I think Basuma is good enough to play the, the role, in my opinion, not just because of, of the first 10 games. I actually think people, I think it's gone under the radar that he has improved recently, in my opinion. I think the last, um, since I think since March time, um, since our form has improved, I actually think Basuma has been a lot better. I think I think he's I think he did go for a really patchy a bit of form just after those red cards and just before the Afcon and maybe a bit after the Afcon as well where he was struggling with a bit of confidence he wasn't maybe playing at, at that that good of a level and probably could have been dropped but I do think he's come out of that a bit I do think he's looked a bit better recently actually looking a little bit more confident not just, not just the West Ham game I'm talking about I think before that as well obviously taking the Fulham game out of it where he was terrible and I think so with most of the other team but I actually do think uh, by large in recent weeks it's been a lot better from Basuma he's looking a lot more confident now in terms of his attributes from what we want in the number six what uh, does he fit it I think defensively he does I think he's more than good enough defensively to, to do that role I think when when it comes to on the ball his ball carrying ability that kind of stuff I think he's um, good enough to do it if he is doing that job he has to be confident to take on his man and all those kind of things I do think um, uh, he's good enough when he's on his game to do that the one thing I do question is his passing ability I'm not saying he's a bad passer but I, do, I think he's a very safe passer. And when he's asked to do more complicated passes, a lot of the time he can be found wanting a bit. His long-range passing isn't great. Um, I do think Ange, in a perfect world, will want, does want a guy in that number six who can ping a ball 60 yards on a sixpence without even thinking. That's the kind of guy he wants in that kind of role. Someone who can progress the ball doesn't need to dribble past players mm -hmm. to progress the ball because he's so good at passing, he can pass it in between the lines, um, he can set up attacks in that kind of way. Now, what Batum was doing earlier in the season was that he was making up for that um, pass. No, I don't think he's a bad passer, but he's not an elite passer. And he was making up for that by being an elite ball carrier. And what he was doing is he was opening up the spaces by driving through the centre of the pitch, which meant that opposition players had to go to him. They had to draw their attention, which left... Um, um, spaces for other players to operate in. Now that has kind of, I wouldn't say diminished, but that has definitely reduced in uh, ever since his uh, um, confidence dropped. So when he's not doing that to the level he was in the first 10 games, when he's basically, first 10 games, he was maybe doing that three or four times a game. And what that meant was that was causing a big problem for opposition because they couldn't really handle his dribbling ability. Now he's doing it maybe once or twice a game. And when he's only doing it once or twice a game, what that means is, he's being a lot safer in, in possession. He's not taking those risks he was early in the game. And it means he's not committing the opposition players like he used to. And when he's not doing that and he doesn't have the passing range that maybe other top sixes have, it means that we're not maybe progressing the ball in dangerous areas as often as we were early in the season. And then he's less effective. And if he's not going to be doing that dribbling that he was in the first 10 games, then I don't think he is suited to the uh, the being our main number six. If he can get back to those dribbling levels and make up for his lack of elite passing range uh, with his on-the-ball ability, I do think he's good enough because I do think defensively, 
I think his numbers are there. I think you can see it. Defensively, he's one of, he's one of the best um, midfielders in, in the league. Tackles, interceptions. Um, I think he's he's more than good enough to cover the, the ground that we need him to cover. It's all a question of for uh, Basuma whether he can be as confident as we know he can be to make up for what I think is um, a fairly... Uh, I would say like above average passing range, and what we want is someone who's an, in, in the elite category. The Rice um, and the, the you know the Rodgers. These world. people just can do it with their eyes closed. Uh, I, I like who I really like as well was that Palacios from Bayer Leverkusen. I don't know if obviously if if we can get him someone like that. I really like uh, a player like that. I think we need a bit more p- technical passing ability in those kind of positions because I think that's something that we're lacking a bit when um when teams are maybe sitting a bit deeper. And we and we need someone who can play a really effective long range pass or something like that, or someone who can drive from deep like Basuma, like he was doing. Those are good things. But my point is, when he's not driving from deep to the level, he doesn't have the passing range to make up for it, and that's where problems come. Someone in the comments says, "Devon on air says Wilson Palacios, you having a laugh? Not quite Wilson Palacios. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't quite. He didn't quite have the elite passing range I'm talking about. I think it's fair to say. Um, is it, what's his name? Ezekiel Palacios, I think his name is yeah. from Bayer Leverkusen. I'm a big fan of his. Uh, someone like that. Um, but I think we need. I, I can't think of the top of my head. I have to have a look around who who these great passers are. But I think someone Zuba Mendy's one as well. Zuba Mendy, I think, is a really good one um, as well. I agree with that. So. Um, would I look right now if you ask me right now would I look to sign number six I think I would anyway just because I think we need to replace Hoybier so I do think we need number six but do we need another oh, is it a priority for me to replace Basuma as our starting number six I wouldn't say it's a priority I think in a, in a perfect world maybe yes I don't think it's I wouldn't go and spend massive money right now on a number six I guess is my point but I think if we can find an opportunity to get someone who's got a bit of a better passing range than Basuma I think I'd probably consider that thing is right and just wants to go and challenge for the league next season right we we can't we can't go through another period like what Bas- basuma did as as our starting six where he's basically a no-show for like three months or however long it was like we need consistent performers um and not confidence players that just rely on 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 past confidence we need players that are going to come in and do it week in week out regardless and i would love to say Basuma can do that but you know last season in the Conte system uh, he was poor maybe that was the system this season he's come in he started like a house on fire and these red cards really seem to knock him and you really saw that confidence sap out of him so the reason I say that I think a six is imperative because if And really does realistically want to go and challenge for that league next season and play in the upper echelons of um, you know challenging the Man Cities the Arsenals and the Liverpools we need someone that's going to come in and, and that can push Basuma to that level. If Basuma's not playing, that can come in and do an equally good or, or better job at Basuma at his best. So if if that is our serious ambitions of going and fighting for the league next season, I, I think we, we have to bring in a top quality number six, in my opinion. Um, anyone ben, else? Yeah, there? yeah, go on. I, I just wanted to say, I think you sold me a bit on uh, adding another one with Onana um, at, from Everton, I believe he plays. Yeah. Yeah, he's a good player, and I always look at our transfer windows now through the Tottenham lens of what you know actually would be realistic in terms of how much money we would spend, and I could see that actually happening. So looking at the midfield being Basuma and then Onana at the six, and I believe it could be a, a Emerson Royale te- a temporary situation where his form drastically picks up because there's some competition, you know, true competition in his spot. So I think having those two there as the um, the, rely, the the constant options at, at the six, and then Bentancourt and Saar at the eight with Madison. And uh, I believe we should bring up Donnelly as a backup from the academy. You know, obviously that saves Levy some money as well. And I think that would be the fastest way to, to for him to improve. That sounds like a good midfield to me. Um, and we also have to consider that it's very likely we're going to have European football next year. Mm-hmm. And the Champions League also has more games than before. Yeah. So squad depth is going to be more important than ever. Yeah, completely agree. Uh, except with, with Jamie Donnelly, I think that to aid his development, I really believe that he should be going out on loan next season to a championship team. Um, 
even if the club's looking better, maybe a lower end Premier League side. I'd love to see Jamie Donnelly play week in, week out, yeah, men's football. I think he's way too good for the for the level he's playing at at the moment, and he needs to be playing in in first team football week in, week out, in my opinion. Uh, but Jory uh, with the super chat says Biz was doing Biz things last game. Hashtag comeback. Big up the Jorical. Um, I, I agree. I, I do think Bisuma was much better um, against West Ham and probably his best performance since. Um, he did get those sendings off. But let's move on and let's talk about Dejan Kulisevsky. Um, we'll start off with you, Sai, on this one. Where, where do you think Deki fits in now? Do you still think that he should be playing on the right wing? Do you think he's more suited to maybe coming inside in the midfield um, under Ange? And how, what, what do you put his poor form down to? Uh, I, always pro- I, I always prefer him in the middle, to be honest. Mm. Uh, however... Yeah, there's there's a slight complication that Johnson's in such great form at the moment and it's very easy to compare the two players in that kind of wide position um, in the sense that one is doing a lot better than the other, uh, both from an assisting perspective and, of course, now the goals. I mean, I, I don't know how many Kudu's got. It's like maybe six or something. The assists aren't as good as they've been in previous seasons. Um, you know, what the answer is to that as to why, I don't really know. Uh, but for me, like Kulu is a very unique talent in the sense of the way that he glides past players, the drive forwards. I mean, there's some instances, I remember even the, the looting game, the way he just pushes himself forwards and can get those just last minute toe pass throughs to make those opportunities. And sometimes they come off, sometimes they don't, of course. Um, but he's been very influential in a lot of the amazing goals this year. Um, you know, if you remember back to that Forest Cross was incredible. Uh, his performance against Villa was, I thought, was fantastic as well. So I, I don't, I don't think he's too, too bad. I mean, it's a bit of a weird one because I always think like in the game against Luton, where I was obviously at the stadium, like many other people, you, you, uh, there was instances in the game where I was like, oh, he's, he's not really being good enough here. Uh, wh- why is that? Um, and it's, it's. It's a bit of a difficult one to put your your finger on, as it were. Um, but then obviously Johnson comes on and changes changes the game, and that's where I think there's a reflective comparison there of of making Kulu look worse than may, maybe he's made out to be. Um, and I think he's he's not actually that bad a player. As I said, I think he has a lot of influence on the game, a lot of drive. But I think a lot of that in previous games has come through that middle position. Um, a lot of people calling to say that he's not good enough to be in a team, this, that, and the other. Well, he was last year. Um, and again, it goes back to that point about reflective opinion of like some instances, oh my God, because he actually is amazing. And then two weeks later, he's not amazing. Let's get him out. Um, and it's just back down to that decisive point about consistency. Again, your exact point about Basuma, Ben, and, and many other players is that to, to be a title challenger or win trophies, you need to have full consistency of every player all the time, not have a few good games, a few bad games, and then for us to sit and go, well, why is he not having a good game? Like, he had a great one last week. Why not this week? Yeah. Um, what, what's happened at home? You know, who knows? Like, uh, there's so many different variables. and it's, it's frustrating. I think that's why you get so many annoyed fans because we see the potential of a player, the incredible potential of a player, and then the next week it's not there. And it's, well, in theory, this is worse position uh, opposition than the team we were playing last week. So in theory, you should be having a hell of a lot more of a, a nicer time in this game. So it's a really difficult one because I absolutely love him as a player. As I said, he's a, I think he's a unique talent. The, the, I just love the way he glides past players effortlessly most of the time. Um, I, I just think... Maybe, just maybe, a lot of the teams have just gauged what kind of player he is. Whereas, you know, when he first came in the team, especially in that Conte season and elements of last season, he was unpredictable. But now people are like, he's just going to try and cut inside. Or he's just going to do this on the edge of the line and try and move his way forward. And players in opposition just know exactly what he's going to do. And that's where, you know, at the end of the day, he's 23, still young. He can still learn and evolve. But... That's where you get a, a really good player turning into a potential world-class one or a great consistent player is one that can adapt, one that can go, they've read me now, I need to change this game. Look how Harry did that. People were just like, yeah, we got we cottoned on to what Harry does now. Then all of a sudden, the next week, he's doing completely different things. And then all of a sudden, 
over a two, three season period, he's become this ultimate player that can do anything and anything that he wanted to at any point in the game. And I think that's where Kulu now needs to figure out himself as a person, as a player, you know, how much does he want to evolve and adapt? Because eventually it will continue the opposition and keep reading him, reading his game. Fans will continue to get frustrated. And I totally get where the frustration is coming from, irrespective of my points that the uniqueness of him and we've seen the elements of talent there. That can only go so far. And that's when ultimately as a manager, he's probably going to sit there and go, you know, do, should you really be a starter? And we've seen that in the last few weeks where Kulu's had obvious frustrations of being taken off in certain games or not playing full games like he used to. And that's what it's about, isn't it? You know, you've got a player that the whole point of a squad rotation or having good players in those positions as backup is that you put them on and that's where you you show the metal of as being a player do you improve do you evolve and adapt or do you just get frustrated and annoyed and then i don't want to be here anymore and there were warnings from many juventus fans when bentecure and kulu came in to say that they usually have a great instance of form and then they'll just disappear are we seeing some of that we don't know but again he's another player where We'll be slating him this week. He'll probably go and have an absolute stormer against Forest, and then we'll have a different conversation next week. The overview of that is we don't want to have that continuation of conversation 50-50. We want to be talking about these players in the fathom of being 100% all the time. So that's kind of like the dilemma in my head, that's for sure. Yeah. I mean, Royce, where, where do you sit with it? Do you think, I mean, where do you see Kulisevsky fitting in, essentially? So I think that he undeniably has some really amazing attributes as a footballer in general, kind of like what Sai said. Um, he's a he's a strong player who has a really large frame and can retain the ball really well. Um, and we all know about his sick left foot when he's given space. Um, the Sheffield goal that he scored this season was my favorite of the whole year because the game was so um, it was such a tough watch. And then we came back at the very end. And obviously he was the one that scored the winner for us. And as Sai said this as well, during uh, the beginning of Conte's time, Kulusevsky was unreal when he first um, really broke into the team. And um, I, I think that kind of like, again, what Sai said, it's, he, he has come a bit predictable and it's, it's almost become a bit of a running joke at the Nashville Supporters Club, how um, a lot of people are, are critical that he doesn't use his right foot enough and, and um, create space that way. And so, like I was saying before, when you consider his attributes of what he's really good at, and when you consider at, at winger, uh, what attributes in Ange's system that you really need um, to be important for success is pace and being able to beat uh, a left back or a right back with a dribble move one on one and create space by yourself. And I, I don't think that those are attributes that Kulisevsky really has in spades, unfortunately. It's a tough one. Um, it's a tough one just because he is a good player, but he may he may not be the best system fit. But I think for right now, the best thing to do is continue with what Ange has done and starting Timo and Johnson um, at the wingers and then bringing him off the bench. So I think that's probably the best way to can uh, to improve his current performance level. I think it's so interesting, um, the current narratives between Johnson and Kulisewski, how different they are even though they're one year apart in age, like Kulisevsky is 23 and Brennan's 22. Um, he's so young. He's so young and, and really could have another five, six years at, at his top, top level. So I think it is important to give him the time to be able to adjust to, to what, um, to, to the way teams are defending him. And um, it's just so funny to me. I, I, I posted this on Twitter that Spurs fans, it feels like just pick a new one of our wingers to, to hate every month. <laughs> we, we need to give it time. We need to give him time. Um, he's, he's really young. And I think, I think that's the best course of action for now. Yeah. And you, you mentioned, you know, he always cuts in on his left foot and doesn't use his right foot enough. But whenever he uses that right, I mean, that goal against Sheffield United was with his right foot. You know, right. how many times um, whenever he uses that right foot, he uses it with quality. So I, I just don't get why he doesn't use it more often. It drives me absolutely insane uh, that he doesn't use it um, as often as as maybe we would like. But with Kulisevsky, 
I just want to put it out there. I love Kulisevsky. I think he's got such unbelievable attributes and he definitely has a space in this team, in this squad, 100%. But I question massively if that space is on the right-hand side. I feel like with the way that Ange wants to play, get his wingers really wide, get crosses in the box, um, make those runs uh, into the box that Brennan does so so successfully. And how many goals has he got with making those runs into the box? And Kulisevsky just doesn't make those runs. And I feel like that's a key staple of an Ange post Koglu team. Um, so for me, could playing Kulisevsky on the right wing is more like putting a square peg in a round hole. And it just, it can work because of the quality that Kulisevsky has and he can, can create chances uh, when playing there. But it's just not a natural fit to what Ange Postacoglu wants to do. So where I would like to see Kulisevsky kind of fit in is compete with Madison at, at that number 10 role. And when we're playing against a low block, maybe play alongside Madison in that midfield as well, because I, I can see real value of having Kulisevsky there. Um, but like I said, I love him as a football player. I think he's he's got such amazing attributes, but I just don't think he's 100% suited to that right wing, uh, the way Ange wants to play it. Uh, where are you at with it? Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment um, on Dejan Kulisevsky. I'm one of his biggest advocates. I absolutely love him. I think he's a top quality player. I think he's so many good attributes. And I think people forget as well, you know, everyone goes back to these first 10 games of the season. Well, who was, who was starting right wing in those first 10 games of the season? It was Kulisevsky. And he was doing really well, a good job um, in, in, in that run as well. I, I was giving him a lot of high praise. What he, he wasn't, you know doing what Brendan Johnson is doing now, which is, you know, getting to the byline, you know, those those whipped um, crosses across the face of goal, um, which has been Brendan Johnson's staple in recent weeks. Kulisevsky doesn't really do that um, to a consistent level, unfortunately. He's a different kind of player to Brendan Johnson. But what he was doing was because he was he's so strong on the ball he's a really good ball carrier um he's he's really difficult actually to get the ball off and to dispossess um mm. when he's on the ball so what he was doing when he was getting the ball he was driving into the penalty area and causing a lot of problems for for opposition um defenses because when you get that um someone like Kulisevsky on the ball i think um at some one point in the season i think it was maybe halfway through the season he was the um highest player in the whole league for carrying the ball into the penalty area and that's a really important quality to have when you've um, even from a player on, on the wing as well I think he has had obviously good games on the wing even recently he has yeah I look back at the Villa game where I thought um, he was he played on the right wing and had a really great game I think he ended up getting with um, two assists on the day um, actually one assist he went down the right cut it back on his right foot for Son who obviously ended up scoring I think it was the third goal on the day so I do think he can do it. Um, I don't think it's his natural game. I think that is definitely true. His natural game is he likes to get involved. He likes to knit the play together. He likes to get close to other players. He likes to play little one-twos. He likes to actually... I feel like he likes to actually be um, close to defenders in a way so he can shove them off and create space that way. I actually don't... I think when he's like on the right-hand side and he sees loads of space in front of him to run into, I don't think that's what he wants. So I don't think he likes to like attack that space. I think he likes to be close to people so he can create space by um, by shoving players off and then obviously that creates um, a bit of space for him to uh, uh, operate in and he likes to cut inside we all know that he likes to play um, in in those tight spaces now the now the thing is recently uh, and I think Andrew's definitely said it he likes his wingers to I think what Andrew, what Andrew wants from his wingers, he wants wingers who love to attack the, those spaces. He loves wingers to take on players, run at players, commit them, and obviously beat them one-on-one. -on -one. And then um, more often than not, what I think he really wants is a winger to get to the byline and whip it across the face of goal. I think that's what he's got with Timo Werner on the left-hand side. That's what he's got with Brendan Johnson on the right-hand side. And I think that's... Um, um, also what it does is it makes the pitch a lot wider because both wingers are touching the hugging the touchline and it creates more space for the players in the centre to operate in and now Kulisevsky does things in a different way doesn't mean he can't be effective which I and I do think he has been effective in many games but definitely recently he's caused us problems I, um, and what I've said previously I do definitely think is true I actually don't think Deki himself individually like is playing badly or it, or is or is doing bad things like for example that everyone points that Luton game you know where even Ange pointed out and I think it was fair to say he kept cutting inside he wasn't doing what he wanted but even that game he could have gone into half time with two assists if the finishing was better from from uh, those attackers so I think that's evident that even the what this is so what I'm trying to say is what I like about Kulisevsky is even when maybe he's not doing the right things he's still contributing to the team he's still creating chances for us but 
the reality is when he's not doing those things that Ange is asking him to do, it is hurting the team as much yeah. as he's doing good things for the team. As a team dynamic, what it does is it clogs up the spaces. It doesn't allow uh, for more uh, for spaces in the central areas to be operated in by the likes of Saar and Madison. So they, you know, you know when you see Saar run through the heart of a of a midfield and attack that space in between the fullback and centre back, that doesn't happen if Kulusevski is continually operating inside, and that's something he has to learn to try and stay wider. But it's you know it's going to take some coaching out of him because that is in his natural game. He likes to get on the ball and 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 knit the play together with other players. So. I think, you know, Decky said himself, he likes to play in the centre. He sees himself more as a, what he calls a, um, what's called a Mazala, which is a player who's kind of a half centimetre, half winger. Um, it's what I compare like a Bernardo Silva kind of player. Someone who's more, who's comfortable in the central areas, but also is comfortable out wide. Um, but then the question is, if he does see him like that, what is the position for him uh, in, the, in this kind of team? Um, it's a difficult question to answer because I don't think... I think he can, but I don't, I, I'm not sitting here thinking he uh, he can't play right wing. I do think he can, in my opinion, but not to. But does it hurt the team in some in some incidents when he does play right wing? Does it hurt the team? I would say yes, it does. So in those incidences, he needs to be more central. So I think it's about a game state. I guess it's difficult to put your finger on. I do. I would love him to be a number eight next to uh, Madison. I actually don't think he is creative enough to be the prime creative you know what i mean i actually i think he's more of a ball carrier dribbler and like short range passer i don't see him as a guy who will sit on the edge of the area and like pick a lock with a with with incredible passing range um like someone like a madison will so i don't think he actually has the creative tools to be a prime creator but to be a secondary kind of creator next to madison i think he's more than creative enough to do that kind of role the question is you know, you've got Sai, you've got Bentancourt. Is there a space for him in the number eight? That's a difficult question. So maybe, you know, you persist with him in the right wing for now until we have better alternatives. Um, uh, obviously, we have Ben and Johnson there at the moment. And so you have him maybe rotating in the right wing and, and see if he can learn that way of playing at the moment. It is a bit of an awkward conversation because, you know, when he first came in, he was an unbelievable right winger uh, when he first came in under Conte. Um, and at the moment... I think he's a serviceable one. I think he's a good one even, I would say. But he's not the perfect kind of right winger for us at the moment, especially in recent weeks. I actually think at the beginning of the season, he was a really good right winger for us. But recent weeks, that isn't the case. That is fair to say. So I think it's probably right for Johnson to be having his spot. And it's probably maybe right for maybe for him to not be on the team until he can learn how to really play that right winger spot. But um, what I would say is I, I still believe he can be a good right winger for us, in my opinion. You know, I'm going to throw something out there for Dejan Kulusevski. You guys are probably going to think I'm absolutely batshit crazy. Uh, number with, six. With, with what, no, not number six, <laughs> what I'm about to say. But I actually think he's got the attributes that, that can actually fit this role. An inverted right back in this Ange Postecoglou system where, you know, Pedro Porro, he always finds himself operating in like the number 10 areas really high up the pitch where, and I think if Kulisevsky was operating in those areas, and I actually think he's actually not bad uh, defensively as well. I don't think he can play it maybe to the level of, of Pedro Porro, but I think he can play it to a very high standard. And I think... Um, he's versatile enough. He can play that role. I don't know what you guys think. I'll, I'll leave this one open. To what I would say guys. is, if you're looking at creative solutions, what about him in number nine? In the number nine? I think him in number nine could be because he's got the physicality for it. He's got really good hold-up play. He's got decent enough pace where he could could be a threat in behind it in a short uh, in a short um, um, burst of space. Because if you're in the, in the number nine, you don't need to be um, running in loads of space like a right winger. You have a short um, um, sprint uh, um, period because you're in the number nine, there's not that much movement around. Um, I think he's got decent finishing ability as well. I think a, a number nine, maybe, a, a, like a false nine kind of position might be something. In terms of right back, I think he probably has the attributes for it. I think he would hate doing it. I don't think he would want to do it at all. Um, but and it's I, not a natural right back though, is it? I think it's a different, like he'll find himself in, in no, the areas every, that he'll like Every to time be in. we lose the ball, he's going to have to be sprinting back into that right hand position. I think he's going to hate doing that. I think he probably, again, I think he probably has the attributes for it. I don't think he would want to do it that's all i'm saying mm. Royce, what's, what's your feeling yeah so uh just to on both of you guys' talking points in terms of right back i agree uh ben and what you're saying moving forward i think that he totally could fit the system but i i haven't 
seen him defend one on one. And, you know, obviously mm. in the Premier League, that's a different kettle of fish. The wingers that he's going to be going against. Yeah. Like, whoo, it took it took Poro a little bit of time to really get to grips with it. And he's such a tenacious defender now. So that I do worry about. You know, obviously, whenever we lose the ball, we're really, really open a lot of the time to counterattacks. And so I also do question whether he has the pace to be able to get back fast enough, you know, when we're caught out to really try and get in front and stop opposition moves. But I do understand what you're saying. I don't think you're you're completely crazy. I, I understand where you were coming from with that. I just I just have a, a few worries in terms of right back. But yeah. in terms of number in terms of the number nine position off what you were saying, Sam, I, I think I agree. I think especially against low blocks, it could, he could be a really uh, valuable resource because he has a big frame. He's a big guy and, and he's able to link up passes really well. So and, and be able to retain the ball, you know, with a lot of defenders around him. So I definitely think that's an experiment worth um, worth exploring, um, mm. especially when, you know, either Rashawson is hurt or, you know, Sonny a lot of the time isn't as effective in low blocks as well. So maybe move Sonny to left wing. There's a lot of options, but I, I definitely could see could see um, him playing in the number nine against low blocks. Yeah. And also like because because of his size, I've never seen him challenge in the air, but I imagine he won't be too bad in the air because of his sheer strength. Like, why wouldn't he be good in the air? Um, mm. in terms of getting crosses in the box or a different avenue. Scored one against City, didn't he? Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. So, Sai, do you, what do you think? Right back, number nine, where are you sitting with um, him? I think he's too slow for a right back. Uh, yeah. Exactly what Roy said in regards to that pace that you need when wingers are attacking you. Uh, that number nine position is definitely in my favourable for him. Um, and I think that's his favourable as well from what he's been saying in previous you know, interviews and things. Um, and to that point of even the Man City goal, I think what was quite interesting is, I think it was the documentary that he released recently where he was talking about that goal in particular, that actually the uh, entire dugout was shouting to Kulu to get into the middle of the box because they knew that cross was coming. There was no other <coughs> height or strength in that box. And obviously his momentum, I think it was against Ake at the time, mm -hmm. um, just absolutely canes the ball into the in like it was a slightly slow curve wasn't it to a but i think it was that middle position that's perfect and it proved that you know he can take people by surprise in that box in the middle format and i think that's that could be absolutely perfect to not suggesting at all he's going to be on uh kane's momentum of headed goals or anything like that but I do think we miss significantly the physicality in, in the box when those crosses come in. Most of them tend to be along the ground and just hope for the tap in. Nine times out of ten, it's not always working. So I think we need to have that different dimension. And he's that kind of player that stitches everyone together, that can beat players very very sneakily and very cleverly as well. And he has an, a sensational left and right foot. So use that to your ability, almost like when Lacelso comes on, when he got those great goals against City as well from those middle positions why are we not trying it enough from those areas instead constantly just down those lines trying to get the ball in or walk it in you have to have a different dimension and i think kulu could bring that and if you've got you know i don't know who plays where anymore if you put kulu in the middle it, it opens up opportunities elsewhere but when you've got johnson on that that right side putting those kind of balls in and at different paces different levels mm. of height it can be massively advantageous if you've got a player like Kulu on the end of them, uh, not just Son as well, of course, from that lower lower ground perspective as well. So for me, it's it's a number nine over the right back. I'm sorry, Ben. But. <laughs> that's, well, that's also actually another criticism of Kulisesi I do have as well when he plays on the wing, not, um, is that, you know, those, those um, tap-ins that Johnson gets at the back post, he's just constantly there making those runs. Kulu doesn't do that enough. And not to say he can't do it. I remember, I think, earlier in the season against Bournemouth away, he was he he, he made that run and, and got that goal yeah. uh, and, and, and was able to do that. So we, we know he's, seen it since, though. Yeah, he's capable of doing it, but I think maybe... Maybe it's just he needs to uh, he needs more coaching on how to play Andrew's system because obviously he's such a great player. He's got all these qualities. Um, I think he can do it. I actually think Johnson, um, in terms of uh, because he was so new to the team and obviously he's come to come in with Ange, he's maybe a bit, been a bit more moldable straight away. But I think um, Kulisevsky 
if he can learn these things, I think he could be a top player in that position. I just think he needs to trust himself a bit more in those situations. And he needs would, to be making would, those runs. Would playing him on the on the left like solve a lot of these problems with his inability with with his um, you know, his the way the way he keeps cutting inside to go on his left hand mm. side? Like if he played on the left wing, surely that naturally would make him go on the outside a bit more. Like, yeah, I don't understand so. why we haven't tried that. Yeah, I don't know. He he doesn't he doesn't fancy it for some reason. Um, I remember there was one game. I think it was Newcastle. You had a little period on the left wing. He looked quite good there, but I haven't seen yet Decky go to like drive down the left and have a cutback yet. So maybe he's just not 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 as capable as doing it on the left. I don't know, but yeah, maybe that is something as well to consider him on the left. So basically, we're playing him everywhere apart from in goal. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> Centre back is tall. He can he can end the ball. Yeah, why not? Um, Jory with the super chat says Decky as the number ten. Madders needs help um, with multiple competitions, and I think what you what I think. What we can take from this conversation with Dejan Kulisevsky is that he's so important that he, you know, he's so versatile in so many different areas of the pitch that we can utilize him in next season with the amount of games that we're going to have next season. So, mm. um, definitely an asset to have for us. But in terms of the last topic of the panel, we are going to be talking about Sai's favorite man, Daniel Levy. <laughs> and um, look, Daniel Levy's just taken another bonus, three million pounds, I think it was. His first bonus since the completion of the stadium, I think in 2019, where he took a three million bonus. Royce, I see you shaking your head there, so we'll go to you first. Do you think that bonus for Daniel Levy is justified? Um, and give me the reasons uh, why you think that. Short answer, absolutely not. No, I would say that that bonus uh, was not deserved. To me, there hasn't been enough evidence on the pitch, especially especially when you consider um, how last season went. I, I really, you know, find it tough to believe that you know he was deserving of that. If there was one thing that he would be deserving of the bonus for, it would be appointing Ange Postacoglu. I think that's the best decision that he has made for this club in years, years. I would almost say um, since hiring Poch. Right, right. <laughs> when you consider. <laughs> Um, when you consider how the season ticket prices as well also increased, it's like, Levy, what was this? Was this all a ploy for you to to get yourself another bonus? Like, what's what's going on here? No, I, I would say for me, I, it's tough to say that it's uh, you know how, how does somebody in the ownership group you know justify a bonus? Um, but at the same time, I, I really don't think that. It was it was deserved, especially when you consider the raise in the season ticket prices. Yeah, I I, com I couldn't agree more. To be fair, but Sai, um, what's your thoughts? Well, um, yeah, it's kind of on the <laughs> level, really, of uh, yeah, politicians, bankers to the highest level, uh, where you always saw those obscure bonuses, despite you know. Uh, either giant profits or in some cases losses, but still able to take a humongous bonus. I remember the days of retail when BHS and all that were around when you've got employees, you know, working their asses off and then being laid off, but it's okay. The, the, the boss of the company can just take a few million out, no questions asked. And it's a bit of a, a further kick in the teeth in the sense that the man should be, in my opinion, trying to appease fans as much as possible yeah. over these last 20 odd years of arguably a sense failure most of the time. Um, I could understand some of that bonus being attributed to the commercial aspect because I've hand on heart always said that it's very hard to find a, an amazing businessman as Daniel Levy. It's like he is phenomenal at what he does in terms of the monetary perspectives. However, um, as a football club, as fans, and we've talked about this numerous occasions in the past about that loyalty aspect has gone out the window. Um, you know, the, the diehard fans <laughs> are getting more and more stressed out about everything and how things have been, been going and still arguably con continue. Um, we've had the Levy out aspects of that and it did sort of reverse itself a bit with new staff coming in to take over footballing matters, et cetera, et cetera. So there's definitely good paths that have been put in there. It's still not good enough. It still needs to be improved upon. But this whole point of the bonus comes at a 
I don't know. Again, I've said this many times as well. I don't know who their PR team are, but they really need to start looking at things in a bit more detail. They can't obviously stop his bonus, but for God's sakes, two weeks ago, telling people that the prices are going up, especially yeah. to senior citizens, which is an absolute disgrace. Uh, I have you know many things I could say on that point um, to then come out and go, oh, yeah, three million. <laughs> Because it doesn't take a genius to split that three million out or at least say, okay, the X amount of hundreds of pounds that you're trying to charge more people for, particularly senior citizens in this instance of conversation, is actually you could take a million of that and help a lot more towards the fans. Now, it's a bit of a difficult scenario because you could argue that, well, if you're in that position, would you take it? Well, I'm very sure <laughs> most people would because of the amount that it is. Even if it was 100,000, people are going to probably still question it, or 500,000. Obviously, it's a lot less than 3 million. It's still a big amount. Um, and that conversation has been not even just in football, not even just as Spurs fans with Daniel Levy. It's been across the board with governments, politicians, bankers, as I've said, um, where it's been scrutinized, people complain and whine about it. They're not going to give the money back. So it's just one of those things, once again, we have to suck up and and just understand that this is the kind of owner that we have or you know, consortium that we have in charge that will see the football club purely and solely as a business. Ultimately, that's all they worry about. Um, and they will take their dividends. They will take their shares like any other business owner or, or director would of any company. It just so happens that they had a very lucrative year or so with developments of concerts and everything else that's going on that he has been rewarded for that element mm. of it. On the pitch, we are still questioning this. Yes, you should not be giving good bonuses out just because you picked a good manager, which, by the way, probably was nowhere near the top five choices, in my opinion. Um, and it just so happened it paid off like Pochettino did, who, again, was not a first team, uh, sorry, a first choice manager. So there's ducks in the line in the sense that he can just turn around and go, well, everything's going well. Spurs fans can pipe down now, stop singing, Levy out, which is what we always do. We go into these phases of going crazy with protests and then it goes quiet because we're in a transitional period, give people time. And then we'll be probably back to this square again in the future. But it, it, the, the, the Levy out thing we can kind of put aside for a second in the sense that you're taking a bonus on the back of all these things that you're doing to loyal fans. And and some of these fans like my dad have been going since the 50s and 60s. My dad always talks to me about going to those games when he was a kid, 10, 12 years old, watching that 60s team all the way through the crap football that we've had for many decades, in, in, in argument's sake. Um to be then thrown in the face that, oh, well, to be sustainable, we need to do this. Well, hang on a minute. You're telling us you're making 15 million off these concerts. You're now taking 3 million out for your own pocket to do whatever you want with. But it's OK to take which, you know, a few hundred pound to most people is a lot of money that they now have to come up with to try and watch their team. Um, and in this instance of uh, uh, you know, it's, it's across the board, of course, but for senior citizens in particular, we're talking about all these pension issues and stuff going on in the country, the economy as well. I've got my you know, crypto finance hat on at the moment. I think it's absolutely ludicrous and disgusting that you could take that money. But the poster behind me uh, has been with me for a long time. You know, in order to be in the 1%, you have to do what the 99% don't. And that's exactly what Daniel does. He's taken that 1% initiative to take that 3 million. He doesn't have the empathy. He doesn't have the the mindset to think, oh, maybe actually I should, as again, back to that point, no one's really going to do it if they're offered that kind of money, obviously. But there should be something consciously or morally in your mind to sit there and go, well, we have had a bit of a discrepancy with ticket prices, et cetera. Maybe perhaps we can do a bit of leniency on this bonus. But that's me in a dream la la land of where I think I would like to live in a world, but that's just not how it goes. So the answer to your question, long and short of it, is absolutely doesn't deserve that three million. Um, and even if it was questionable of one million or five hundred, the point is you cannot do these kind of things or have these kind of instances of opportunity if you're going to throw it back in your face. It's exactly the same as if you're going to be an employer. And you're taking your bonuses, you're taking all your dividends out. But if you're not treating your employees or your customers correctly or appropriately, then you shouldn't be taking that out. But 
that's just my thought and opinion. It's not going to change anything. We're not in la-la land, unfortunately, and it is what it is. But it's, again, another kick in the teeth, and fans will remember this, and they will continue to push for the SOS campaign, which I definitely stand by, of saving our, our seniors in terms of that price bracket. Um, it's easy if you're not in, in that price bracket to just be, ignore it. But one day that will be happening to you and it should have a further stance on it for sure. Um, and I think it's absolutely disgusting. Yeah. I mean, the way I look at it, I just think it's a really bad look uh, when when you look at everything um, all together. You know, even just very recently, the, sa the Save Our Seniors, the senior citizen ticket pricing that or the non-existent seniors that he's, um, you know, uh, just completely taken away um, the, their discounts. You're talking about a 6% season ticket rise where at the first chance of something slightly optimistic Spurs have gone through he's taken that opportunity and raised the, the ticket prices um, by quite a significant way you're looking at the past five years we've just been in the complete wilderness um, bad decision after bad decision after bad decision um, starting with sacking Pochettino or even started before then of um, you know not kicking on when we needed to kick on yes uh, he does have some credit in the bank in terms of the stadium the stadium is unbelievable but ever since the stadium or even before the stadium started it's just been terrible mismanagement of the football club um time and time and time again and i've been sick of it i've been sick of uh, really? talking about it to be honest but to give yourself a bonus now it's just a terrible look with everything that's been going mm -hmm. on and i think that if if things were going well, Spurs were winning trophies, Spurs were fighting at the top of the league and, and uh, things were going all swimmingly, I don't think anyone would have a problem with him taking out bonuses That's and, and everything like that. Like, you'd, you'd deserve it. He'd deserve yeah. it if that was the case. But that hasn't been the case. And Spurs have been in... We've gone from fighting for Champions League finals and fighting for league titles to not being in Europe for the first time in God knows how long. So I, 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 I don't... It's not go on side. You go back to the COVID time, mate and that furlough situation not paying employees back to my exact point it's it's the one pence it's the one percent mentality um he may not be in that exact one percent bracket but it's that mentality of that egotistic manner um could say sociopath to a, to an extent like most of them are but i think it's just i think it's absolutely disgraceful um, yeah, and you, you could talk about, um, you know, he's done well on the business side, which is fair enough, exactly but, point, yeah. but, but we're a football club and this football club has hundreds of thousands of fans relying on how well this football yeah. team does. And you got to put that in the first in the, in the forefront of your mind. And if this football team's not doing well, um, then what right does he have to take out a massive bonus the of three football, million? The three million. The this is a problem, mate. That, that exactly. Yeah, ex exactly. What size yeah. point that they see? It, they see it as a business. They don't see it as a football club. So when Levy has, you know, and to be to look to, to play the devil's advocate and given credit when he's, you know, done his hardest, getting the stadium together, getting the NFL deal, getting the concert deals, getting the F1 deal, getting all these deals that are bringing loads, and loads of money um, to the let's call it, you know, if they're in his mind to the business. If I'm growing the business in such a exponential manner, which to be fair he is, and the and the business has grown, and if I think you know they, they announced what record revenues uh, uh, recently over now we've broken over um, half a billion a year in revenue, and and that's a lot, and and credit where it's crude, that is a lot down to Daniel Levy, mm -hmm. and so from his mind he's he's looking at that and saying, um, look I've done all this stuff, I I should be getting a, you know, a bit more because I've brought all this revenue to the club, so I do deserve a bit of a bonus for how hard yeah. I've worked how much all the all the biz all the deals i've done so why shouldn't i get um a, like if in any other business i would be getting a bonus so why shouldn't i be getting a bonus in this kind of business the problem comes when it's come two weeks after you've announced that you've raised season ticket prices because you've quote unquote eaten costs since the stadium's been built and that we and we need and we need to raise prices um uh because we th they need this money when you, if you make the calculation the month the money they're going to be getting from raising the season ticket prices are, is around three million, which is an awkward <laughs> conversation because 
that's the three million he's getting. So essentially, what this looks like is Spurs fans are basically paying for his bonus. That's basically yeah. what is this has been made to look like. And if he was smart and clever, he probably would have just delayed his bonus year. So when if they don't increase season ticket prices next season, he can take the bonus and probably not a lot of big thing would have been made of it. Yeah. But now because two weeks before he's he's they, they've made this announcement, we need to raise season ticket prices, which implies like we're losing so much money, we need to raise the prices, otherwise you know we're gonna we're, it's not gonna be um, sustainable why not give something back to the fans at least you've got all these record revenues from the stadium and everything um, a lot of it is built on the built off of the back of the fans obviously you get you get a lot of money from not just the match revenue but all these other events you're putting on and yet you want to basically squeeze every last dime you can out of the fans even if it means that basically it looks like the fans are basically going to be paying for your bonus which is a, 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 everywhere every, a, what's a, basically what it looks like uh, at the moment because of the similarities in in the, the the price rise to what he's going to be earning, so it's a horrific PR uh, look for the club. I, I don't think he should be taking a bonus uh, this year, especially. Well, like you're, you're implying, like we need to raise the prices because you know we're in a tough financial situation. We need the more money. We need we, we we need to operate as a club. We can't operate unless we open up the prices. And then you basically what you're saying is the 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 price uh, rise is as significant as a bonus you're getting. That is what you're saying. Is that, is that significant? So how significant is it if it's just a bit of chump change that you're giving yourself at the end of the year? Yeah, you have to put that on the fans. So it can't be that a significant amount of money that you have to raise, that you have to put the prices up. It's, you're, you're basically saying when you put the price up, it's so significant that would the club get this money, we need to raise the prices for the fans. It's not and sustainable. Then, but and that, it's not sustainable. And then on the uh, then a couple of weeks later, you're saying actually that that kind of money, that kind of money, I'm taking, I'm taking as a bonus. I'm taking as a but not even as well. I'm taking as a bonus on top of my wage that's how significant this money is to you so that from from that point of view is an absolute disgrace that that he's put it that way yeah absolutely mm -hmm. spot on absolutely spot on uh but Sai, there's um the financial results came out yesterday right and one of the um points in it was to capitalize on our long-term potential the club requires a significant increase yes. in its equity base the board and its advisors rothschild and co are in discussions with pr prospective investors uh what, what do you make out of that yes it's it's a difficult one because well it's it's ironic we're talking about the one percent and they've uh mentioned the roth rothschild co um yeah at the end of the day we know definitively that there's they're, they're trying to to sell for the right price daniel has come out with that publicly many times that you know that it's not like up for sale in the window as it were but if an interesting offer came in we we would have to look at it would that be the percentage allocation like we're seeing at united now with ratcliffe or will it be a hundred percent buyout i mean there's so many variables there. I wish Sean was on the tea, on on this panel right now to explain a bit more detail. But um, in that instance of you know how much lucrative debt that we've got in terms of the stadium, you know it's a billion odd pound stadium. We've got loans on top of that as well with a fantastic interest rate of something like two point something percent for the next twenty years. It's formidable. Like Eight hundred million pounds, I think yeah, it is. It is incredible what he is doing. I've always admired him as a as a business person, um, and that kind of that, that kind of aspect of him but um it, it, in terms of the investment side of things I, I i think you know if you look at the revenue opportunities of these concerts and things it won't take a genius to understand that actually it's not going to take too long to pay all these things off i, don't, I doubt if it would take the whole 20 years i think they'll do it a lot quicker if they're doing concerts on like that beyonce level of arguably 15 20 million a time for three or four sets and they're doing that a few more times a year because bear in mind as well the event capacity will increase. They'll have the apartments, which are starting the building work now as well. You've got 2028 coming up with the um, the, the tournaments as well. On top of that, it's just going to be lucrative business for them constantly every year. The football side of things, back to the point about football being an entity, is in the sense, actually, they don't need loyal fans like us anymore. The, the tourist attraction is there at the end of the day, right? So if I go and sell my season ticket tomorrow, someone will snap it up. Like, you can complain all day long. That's just how football is, has gone on to be. And and football isn't, like, almost essentially the be or end or for, for the whole business anymore. Um, that's not to say that they can just forget about football. We'll just focus on these other things at all. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that there's now a huge branch office as a company. You've got Enoch. Uh, which have sold off the majority of their, their shares to 
you know levy's group his family group essentially that's why if you look at the proper documentations of the business um aspects you've got like levy events and all these other weird names that he's made up over the last few years dividends flying left right and center tax probably tax evasion to some extent as most people do um the corner into Just some products. casual well, tax evasion <laughs> well you know like enron look at enron as a great yeah. example however many years ago that was of making companies up and mar- passing money it's all a game and and it's clever how how it's all being done and i think from an investor's perspective if you're looking outside of tottenham you're looking at what's going to be happening from the generation project around the whole area you're going to be looking at uh, how much money that stadium is making regularly. Um, so when you absorb that debt, how long is it going to take you back? What kind of incremental revenue are you going to make? So it, it's it's very interesting to an investor. Um, they were probably in a dilemma now thinking, wow, maybe it's, being, it's better than we thought it would be. Will we actually cling on to this a lot longer? Um, that's all we've known um, as Spurs fans for the last 20 odd years is Daniel Levy's tenureship. We've never really seen Joe Lewis and what actually goes on behind closed doors, what his actual full relationship is, other than tanking some money in here, there and everywhere, taking some dividends like Daniel does. Um, it could be a prime opportunity, but it always opens up that question. As as a Spurs fan, who do you want as an investor? Do you want the oil money? Uh, do you want the other crazy money that of where, the, where it comes from source-wise? Or do you want someone... <laughs> someone random that's a Spurs fan that's all of a sudden made themselves a multi-billionaire that's going to take over and have a, a party with us as fans and take us in the direction we would love it to go to. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a difficult one. Um, but, you know, that whole aspect of equity is very interesting because they have had the loans. They're obviously clearly looking, in my opinion, for partial investors. I don't think they would ever sell 100% of that at all because of what it does it's a machine um and it will continue but what, what to does partial what does partial investment look like uh for us as fans do you reckon um well i guess it depends on how much leeway they want to give away i mean at the end of the day it's, it's what 51 percent that you have to have as majority to be the overall conductor of everything i can't imagine from the egotistic perspective that daniel would want to give away more than that so i would anticipate that essentially based on the kind of residual value of this amount you know 25 30 percent is probably something that he would be looking for and goes back to my point that that's very reflective on a similar amount that Ratcliffe got part of united for that you've got enough to do something with enough to be a stakeholder or a shareholder to a significant level but still everything will have to be signed off by the man himself daniel of course um and any progressive matters but the stadium's being built, or ha- sorry, has been built, obviously. The structure of it is already done. The training facility is already done. An owner that comes in is purely looking at how much revenue you're going to make from all these external things and how much money can I make off this from a dividend perspective or a revenue perspective every year. Um, it's not like they have to come in and go, oh, God, we need to build a new stadium. We need to do this, 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 and this. It's already been planned. It's already been done. You're just injecting some money in with some lucrative return on it over 5, 10, 15, however many years it is. So that's where I see it. I just cannot envision him selling 100% off. And I don't think there's many people out there that can just go, yeah, here's five, six billion. Let's go and have some fun with this. Um, There are some, but I wouldn't really want to personally welcome that kind of ownership. Um, It would put in question as is Daniel's ownership better than what that ownership could be like. That's where it's always like the grass isn't always greener. But equally, we know that things could improve and especially towards fans but it's always that looped back point that the fans don't really matter much anymore they're going to fill the seats regardless um you know it's great marketing great advertising great attraction from around the world people are flying around the world to come to these games every week if we don't have our seats taken someone else will take them and that's just how football is today so it is soul destroying sometimes but it's the reality and i think Mm. that's just uh the interesting point that Tottenham's at now is it's gone such a high level, not on the pitch, but as a, a magnitude of money making and a commercial entity um, is where it's at now at a crossroads for them probably as to what they want to do with it moving forward. So as fans, where do we sit with that? I don't really think we sit anywhere with it because we have no choice but to just accept what, what happens. Mm. Royce, uh, do you have any thoughts on the matter? Yes, I <clears throat> I did want to 
to say that it, it is really disappointing. Um, the bonus back to what the original point was when you consider before the stadium was built, what were we told? You know, this is going to bring us so much money. Um, we're going to really see a ton of investment into the club because of this stadium. And then how long did we go without signing players while we were building the stadium? Yeah. And so now the, the stadium is built and we're having a statement released with Levy saying that we're still going to need additional investment coming off the back of a raise in season ticket prices and his bonus. It's it's all, all together. It is really, really disappointing to see, to be honest. Um, I, I don't know what the answer. There really isn't an answer because kind of like what Sai said, I, I see Levy as someone who really wouldn't sell 100 percent of the club unless an offer came in that he couldn't refuse. So um, I think we're just going to have to accept it as our, our reality for the time being and just understanding that our owners aren't people right now who are, who are going to be putting in a, an obscene amount of money in a club like um, you've seen other clubs do in, around the Premier League recently. But like with Chelsea, you know, with the recent American ownership, it doesn't always work out. Like I think uh, I forgot which one of you had said the grass isn't always greener. It's not. It's not always you know greener even when you put in a ton of money on the club. Uh, into a club. So I, I don't think the fans um, should be happy. I think you're justified in being frustrated with Enoch, but um, it's important to realize who they are and just, you know, stay as positive as you can with that, with that frame of mind, knowing um, that our ownership isn't really going to, you know, push the boat on huge, huge signings, I would say. Um, it's, but yeah, I know the, the bonus really, I'm, I'm glad you said that, Ben, um, the statement about the additional investment, because the bonus in combination with that really frustrated me. Mm. All right, I think we are running out of time, but let me just go through a couple of comments because it won't be a discussion about Levy if Brian Daigle hasn't chimed in and he's here <laughs> in the comments and he says they aren't looking for partial investment. I have heard this so many times. It's all talk to get the fans believing it's not my first rodeo. We know it's not <laughs> your first rodeo, Brian. Right, I think it's time to book your flights and get outside that training ground right. again. Um, and he says, again, a follow-up comment. He says, I can go to a land Lamborghini showroom and look at a cat doesn't mean I'm going to buy it. <laughs> um, and we've got a couple of super chats as well. Uh, from the Joracle, he says, remember the core business of THFC is to get more of the fans' money. So how good a businessman do you want Levy to be? Big up, lads. And um, Brian Daigle with a member's chat. 41 months as a member, Brian. Come, Come on, on, son. And he says, Daniel Levy, once again with his sleight of hand tactics, has you looking in one direction whilst doing something in the other direction to screw the fans. Well... Well, there you go. Any response to that? On a positive note, I'm lads, and on a positive note today. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's saying he's saying not a cat, a car. Bloody autocorrect. <laughs> I thought it was a bit strange. <laughs> but look, I think that does bring an end to the panel show today. I want to say a massive thank you to Royce and to Sai uh, for coming on today. Uh, Royce, do you want to let the people know out there where they can find you and what content you've got coming up on your channel? Yes, this was so much fun. Thank you guys again for giving me the opportunity to share my opinions with you today. Um, this weekend, one time a year, the Premier League picks a city in America to do a fan fest. It's where like a few hundred Premier League fans are going to gather and watch all of the match days live. Um, they're bringing the Premier League trophy. Ledley King is coming to Nashville mm -hmm. for a Q&A. So I'm going to be filming this entire weekend um, and I cannot wait to bring that unique and entertaining content. You can check me out, Tip Top Tottenham, uh, YouTube, TikTok and Instagram. That's where those videos will be. Um, thank you guys so much again. I really appreciate it. I had so much fun. Good to Thanks, have boys. you. It really was good to have you. And hopefully we'll have you back soon and uh, keep calling into the, the uh, fan shows. Doing a great job on there as well. But uh, Sai, let the people know where they can find you, my friend. Uh, either on the beach down here on the coast of <laughs> Portsmouth or uh, you can find me on uh, my Wales of Wall Street channel if you are interested in blockchain, web free tech, crypto, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yes, uh, hopefully see some of you over there at some point. 
Yeah, I did ask you guys uh, before we went on air if uh, you had any time constraints, and uh, Royce was like, yeah, as long as it's not two hours long, well, we've gone <laughs> just under two hours, one hour and 59 minutes, so we got you, Royce, but thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We'll be off for a three million pound bonus in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you all very soon. Like, subscribe, and comment, and as always, come, come on, on you Spurs. Spurs.